One fall day, a young and hungry hunter left his village to look for food. He followed a river for many days until he came to a broad estuary marsh. He had never seen so much food before. There were thousands of ducks and geese, migrating salmon, oysters, clams, and crabs. He returned to his family with the news, and they moved their village to the estuary's edge before winter. The new land was good to the people. Winters were mild, and the food was plentiful. Like the bear, foxes, and mink, the humans became another group of animal hunters adapting to life at the estuary. Many years later, a young girl stood outside the cedar longhouse in which she lived. While her father and brothers were hunting from their canoes in the marsh, she headed for the shore where the low tide would uncover clams and oysters. When her woven cedar basket was nearly full, she looked across the bay at the biggest and strangest canoe she had ever seen. It was full of men with shiny hats, colorful clothes. They took one look at the bay and sailed away again. Word spread among the villages that the captain of that canoe was Jose Narvez, and he claimed he owned the bay. What country do you think these explorers were from? The girl married and had a family. As her children grew up, white people came often to trade for beaver and muskrat pelts. Once, the visitors brought a fever to the village. Two of her children got sick and died, and within a year, most of the people in her village had died, and other villages were completely deserted. The girl lived to be a very old woman. The year she died, a family stopped at the estuary shore. Shadrach O'Leary and his family were homesteaders, people who had come to stay. They cleared a farm across from the native village. Soon, more settlers came to the estuary. They built houses and churches, schools, fields, and docks. Shadrach opened the first general store and post office, and his daughter, Miss Maggie O'Leary, became the first school teacher. While the settlers worked away at clearing their small farms, the Big Bay Lumber Company bought up most of the old growth forest covering the hills around the estuary. Growing towns and a growing country needed lumber. The hills were quickly cleared and the logs skidded down to the river and floated to the estuary. From there, they were loaded onto ships and sent all over the world. Folks noticed that the river was much muddier now that so many trees were gone. Fewer salmon came past the town to lay eggs, but there still seemed to be plenty for everyone. Shadrach O'Leary's store was busy when the loggers came to town to spend their hard-earned money. A Dutchman named Peter van der Zee had been eyeing the salt marsh and mud flats on the north side of the bay, remembering dikes and farms back home in Holland. One spring, he hired some Chinese laborers to help him build a dike around 60 acres of marsh. When he raised a bumper crop of barley there the next year, the idea caught on, and it wasn't long before the whole north shore was a strong, straight dike of earth protecting farms from the sea. Young Michael O'Leary was a little disappointed to see his favorite oysters disappear, but he saw a good opportunity, and he started a ferry service across the bay. Big news down in Tacoma, and big changes for this little town on the estuary. The Transcontinental Railroad finally stretched from coast to coast, and the west was now just a train ride away. Shadrach O'Leary built a hotel next to his store. Miss Maggie married Peter van der Zee, and they talked the city council into building a bridge across the river. Michael O'Leary had to give up his ferry business so he decided to try fishing instead.
The only way to get in and out of town was by boat. But big ships couldn't come into such a shallow bay, so the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers brought in a big steam-powered dredge to deepen the harbor, so even the largest ships could sail right up to the dock. That was not very good for the crabs and salmon that used to live in the eelgrass bed, but it was very good for Michael O'Leary, who could dock his fish boat right next to his dad's store. Fishing was good back then, so good that someone from back east built a big cannery near the dock. People all over the world were eating fish that grew up in Washington estuaries. Now the town was really growing. Those endless marshes and mud flats were slowly shrinking. They were easy to fill, making new land for houses and businesses. Many people in town wanted a house overlooking the water. And of course, back then, nobody thought much about sewage treatment. The wastewater from the houses and businesses and cannery just drained into the bay. And there the tide washed it away each day and nobody worried about it. With the town growing so fast, the power company built a big dam upriver to generate electricity. Salmon could no longer spawn in the gravel beds above the dam, but salmon were so plentiful then that it didn't seem to be a problem. The lake that formed was stocked with trout, and the inexpensive hydroelectric power attracted new industries. Maggie and Peter Van Der Zee's son became the manager for the new paper mill down the dock from the store. Some of the neighbors complained about the smell, but they were glad that so many people had work in the mill. Huge freighters sailed right up to the dock now. They carried away logs, canned fish, and paper products. A developer from Oregon bought the Van Der Zee farm and built a marina on the North Shore. The old harbor was getting so busy with freighters and big fish boats that people needed a safe, convenient place to keep their cabin cruisers and sailboats. Soon, many people in town moved across the river to the new development by the marina. Airplanes were a new, faster way of moving people and goods, but the little runway on the south side couldn't keep up with modern traffic. The city built a new airport on the only piece of flat land left between the mountains and the bay. People started looking around at their city. They saw polluted water, air, and land. Some of them joined in the activities of the first Earth Day. Maggie and Peter Van Der Zee's great-grandson, Peter, was in the fifth grade class at Bayside Elementary. His class celebrated Earth Day by cleaning up the last bit of estuary habitat left in the bay, not too far from his grandparents' farm. Before long, people passed laws to protect the air, the land, and the water. The piece of estuary that Peter's class took care of was set aside as a park. Today, the estuary is being used by many people in many different ways.